Take a thought and write it down Watch your eyes fall to the ground Light a spark, catch a flame Watch your eyes in freedom's name Another stinging tune from those rockin' bumblebees. Uh, caller number one, you are on the air. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 I'd just like to say, uh, uh, it's a pretty disgraceful treatment of those, uh, those, uh, uh, Hey, Mom! Hey, Rory. How was your day at school? Uh, it was pretty boring. Boring? What do you mean, boring? Ed. Don't they teach kids anything in school anymore? We learn lots of stuff, Grandad. Oh, yeah? Like what? Oh, the Christmas Rising. The what? The Christmas Rising, Grandad. We're our own lost. At Independence. Ah, oh, Easter Rising, Rory. Easter. Do you know why they call it that? Eh, uh, nope. Because it happened at Easter. Ah, uh, now I get it. What kind of gobbledygook do they teach at that school? Take a seat. And I'll tell you the real story of the Easter Rising. It all began with the notion of a city taking on an empire. It was 1914, and World War I had just begun. Which meant that Ireland's main hope of independence, home rule, was postponed. Excuse me, sir. This led to a massive split in the Irish Volunteers, which were the closest thing we had to an army at that time. The majority of the Volunteers went to fight for Britain in the war, leaving only a few (gasps) thousand at home to fight for independence. Some say the revolution began the previous year at the funeral of a leading patriot, O'Donovan Rossa. Our foes are strong and wise and wary. But strong and wise and wary as they are, they cannot undo the miracles of God who ripens in the hearts of young men the seeds sown by the young men of a former generation. The defenders of this realm have worked well in secret and in the open. The fools! The fools! The fools! They have left us a Fenian dead! But to fight an army as powerful as the British, we'd need weapons of our own, which at the time we weren't allowed to have. So we decided to smuggle them in by yacht into Hoth Harbour. But weapons are only a pebble on the road to revolution. To really capture the minds and spirits of the Irish people, we'd need words of inspiration. Thus, the proclamation was drafted up and thousands of copies printed. So we had words and weapons, but now we needed a plan. Our leaders met in secret and decided to take control of Dublin during Easter by occupying key locations all around the city. However, insufficient weapons and a lack of support forced our leaders to make a hard decision. All volunteers were ordered to stand down. However, a small group of rebels ignored the order and despite their low numbers, decided to go ahead with the rising. Now, the main location was the General Post Office, or the GPO as it's known. Why did they take over a post office, Grandad? Well, back then, there were no emails or text messages or Facebooks. All communication came through the post office. So Uh, if you control that, then you control the flow of information. Yes, Rory? They had Wi-Fi though, right? Nope. Not even Wi-Fi. But it was the first revolution to be broadcast by wireless. Ah, but that's another story. So on Easter Monday, the volunteers pretended to parade down O'Connell Street, but just as they drew level with the GPO, they charged towards it and quickly seized the building. In fact, nearly all the locations were seized with little or no resistance. Most of the British soldiers were off fighting in World War I. And those that remained in Ireland were not expecting an attack. 
We caught them off guard. Or oh. <gasps> and they're over. Then came the reading of the proclamation itself. Irish men and Irish women. No one really appreciated the significance of what Pierce was saying. Most people just saw it as a nuisance. It wasn't until rebels opened fire in some British cavalry that people began to appreciate the seriousness of the matter. The rising wasn't without its flaws though. For example, no attempt was made to seize Trinity College, which, at the time, housed a large number of weapons, with very few soldiers guarding them. Another key location was Stevens Green. Rebels decided the best way to defend it would be to dig trenches and await a British attack. However, unknown to the rebels, a small group of British soldiers had spotted this. And under the cover of darkness, made their way up to the Shelburne Hotel rooftop. When daylight came, the British had a clear view of the rebels below and opened fire. The rebels were sitting ducks and were forced to retreat. Positions were fortified in whatever way they could be. On the rooftop of Marabone Lane Distillery, a rebel soldier used broomsticks to look like sniper rifles and confuse the British. Bloody men, there's dozens of them. The city descended into chaos. Barricades were erected, shops were looted. At first we held Dublin with relative ease, repelling any British attacks with little to no losses. However, this would soon change. The British sent General Maxwell to squash this rebellion, and he arrived in Dublin to take charge of thousands of reinforcements. This was the beginning of the end. Martial law was declared in Dublin. Ammunition began to run low. The number of injured and dead was rapidly rising. Victory, it seemed, was impossible. On Saturday, April the 30th, the white flag of surrender was waved on Moor Street. Six days of intense fighting had left the city in ruins. Rebels were imprisoned and the leaders carted off to Kilmainham Jail for execution. Sadly, yes. That's a terrible ending, Grandad. It's the truth. So that's it? It was all for nothing? Not for nothing. Those brave men and women gave their lives for something far more valuable. Something which, because of their sacrifice, we still have today. It's the cornerstone of our identity. The pride of our small nation. Yes? Well? Well what? The answer. Our cornerstone. Our pride. It's freedom. Didn't I say that? Nope. Oh, apologies, Rory. I thought I'd said it. It's freedom. Ah, now I really get it. The seven men who signed the proclamation were Podrick Pierce, James Connolly, Thomas Clark, 
Thomas McDonough, Sean McDermott, Joseph Plunkett, Eamon Cant.